I am uh, Marshall Damarell. Okay. A long time person interested in mechanical things. Very good. And, and how long have you been interested in clocks? Uh, my clock interest grew in the 1980s. And so uh, I've been a, kind of a clock man since uh, for about the last 30 years. <clears throat> Now, water clocks are a bit unusual. Uh, uh, when did you first learn about water clocks, or how did you get interested in, in water clocks? The first water clock that I saw was at a clock museum in Rockford, Illinois. And it was a very simple mechanism, but it was really fascinating to me how the water was channeled through little channels, left and right, forward and backwards, and a rather ingenious method of uh, taking care of the minute hand and the second hand and all that, and I was uh, quite fascinated by it. Later, I found another clock just like it at the uh, Watch and Clock Museum in Columbia, Pennsylvania. And uh, so that furthered my interest. I'm a tinkerer, and I always like to be building something. And so this idea of a water clock kind of uh, hit my mind as a challenge. Over the years, I've built a lot of things for my own use, my wife's use, my mother's use, whatever. And uh, so I saw this opportunity, you might say, to build a water clock. So rather than invest a lot of money in the material and such, I had this idea of how I wanted to do it. And I built a prototype clock first, which had, it wasn't a beautiful clock at all. It was just made out of all kinds of miscellaneous things. But it did run quite well, and it provided the basic strategy as to how to build the clock that I have here now. This water clock is one of a kind. I have never seen any other water clock that operates on the principle that I develop here. And I take credit for complete, complete credit for the design and the manufacturing of this clock. <clears throat> uh, how long did the clock take to construct? Uh, <laughs> okay, from the very beginning, I'd say I was at it for about 20 years. <clears throat> So I noticed that the, the pendulum on the clock is very long, and I just had a question about why that was so long. Uh, yes, that's a good question. When I first started working on a water clock, I tried to get it with a one second beat. In other words, have the, re the escapement release every second. But for some reason, I could never get the water to flow quick enough from one side of the mass to the other side. And uh, so I did a lot of fussing around, but it just seemed like it wanted to be at 48 beats per minute. And so finally I said, well, I give up. I'm going to make it with 48 beats. Now the difference is, if you have a one second pendulum, the pendulum from the swinging point to the center of gravity, yeah, roughly 38 inches, something like that. But when you go to an inch and a, or one and a quarter beats a second, the length of the from the pivot to the center of gravity of the pendulum goes to about 65 or 66 inches. So you can see that's a substantial difference, and so that's why the pendulum on this clock is so long. <clears throat> So, in terms of size, how big is the, uh, the final clock? Well, at the base, it is about 25 and a half inches wide. And at the same time, it's about 18 inches deep from the front to the back. And then on the height, the top of the spire is 88 inches above the floor. So, it's a pretty good sized piece of equipment. The material in the works is brass mainly. But there are some stainless steel parts, and there are some plastic parts there. The material of the cabinet is strips of walnut laid over inch and a quarter 
my C16 aluminum angle. And, um, and then the panels that are created by that, some of them have glass in them and some of them have birch plywood. And I, I thought that looked nice. So that's the way I made it. <clears throat> Can you, can you talk in a general sense, uh, just a little bit about how the clock works from the point that the water is, is okay. hooked up on? The um, clock has a about a three gallon reservoir down here in the back. You can't see it in the picture. In that tank is an elect a submersible electric pump. And that pumps water from that lower tank up to another tank, which is up here on the, as you're looking at it on the left side, very high, almost to the top of the clock. That tank has um, three openings. One opening is to let the water in the tank. I, think, I guess it's four, I should say. One opening is to let the water into the tank. Then there are three openings for the water to get out of the tank. One of the outlets is an overflow. So the pump puts up more water than what the clock actually needs. So by having this overflow line let in near the top of the top tank, why it controls the level and therefore keeps a constant pressure, a constant head on the clock. From there, there is a, another uh, opening that brings water down here to flow into the rocker arm, as I call it, that goes back and forth. And then there is a smaller line that up near the top that puts water into the water wheel. And so, uh, as I said before, there's two separate entrances for power to drive this clock. <clears throat> okay, the rocker arm, that is this device right here, gets water flowing alternately from one side to the other. And when that happens, these wheels engage this cam right here, which is on attached to the pendulum. So as those go down, they give the pendulum a push. It's a very, very slight amount of, of the energy, but it's what is needed to operate the pendulum. <clears throat> also, attached to the same unit, there's a little device back here with these two vertical wires and they oscillate and through a, through a linkage they move the escapement that lets the uh, works move up one unit of time which is one and a quarter seconds. At first I used different size wheels and um, First I made little wheels, about 5 eighths in diameter. They didn't work. <laughs> I don't know why. So then I made wheels bigger and bigger and bigger. Finally I got to these. These are about an inch and a half in diameter. And they seem to have the right leverage against the uh, pendulum mechanism to make it work. Now the, these cups on the end here restrict the water from flowing out too quickly. When I first made this, I just had a uh, frost like this, but the water would go zip, 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 and I didn't get much torque out of it or much energy. So then I got this idea of these additional buckets. And uh, so now the water comes down rapidly here, and they fill up and produce a um, greater force than was otherwise possible. So, okay. So, so then the water flows down below. And, and then, then the water is discharged here and goes through these two pipes, this one and this one, back into the main uh, main jug. Okay. okay, Marshall, can you tell us about the dial mechanism? Okay. The um, so-called second hand really is on the second hand. It's a one and a quarter second hand. And so it moves ahead one forty-eighth of a minute for every time it indexes. 
in turn, then the minute hand, which is here, it starts to advance to the next minute mark, and this hour hand, it moves ahead every six minutes, one tenth of the way from one number to the next. And so we have the whole ratio there. This goes around once a minute. This goes. This is impulse twice, um, twice a minute, or twice every one and a quarter seconds. And this is impulse every six minutes. Well, can you tell me a little bit about the very top of the pendulum? Yeah, this is the pivot point of the pendulum right up here, and. These rods, which are part of the pendulum, are adjustable with these nuts here and two nuts up above, so they can be shortened or lengthened. Now that doesn't look like that's much of a big engineering deal, but it's a bigger deal than what you think, because if you have one tighter, one too tight, why well, it distorts the uh, shape of the pendulum, and uh, and then. If it distorts the shape of the pendulum, then this does, it's not centered anymore. So the, the, the weight at the bottom hangs straight down, but in between it goes like this. So these, these nuts, the top and the bottom ones, have to be properly adjusted so that they keep the pendulum in a straight line. These things here and the center line uh, have to remain parallel all the time. <coughs> now. Up here, there are four wires, two in front and two in back, and it's a multi-strand wire like you use in hanging pictures, and <clears throat> I made it with the four wires to make it easier to adjust the pendulum. Like I said before, I had to keep the pendulum hanging straight, but with those wires, I didn't want the pendulum to be hanging this way or that way heavier on one wire than the other. So I put those wires like that and uh, I can adjust them very well. And that works quite well. <clears throat> All right, Marshall, what can you tell me about the, the bottom of the pendulum and the uh, scale, the, what is it, the amplitude scale? Yes, uh, okay. it's um, necessary that you know how far the pendulum is swinging so you can re re like retune it. And uh, this seems to run best with a magnitude of about 3.5 to 3.7 on either side of the center. Uh, those are, the, the numbers one, two, three, are approximately, represent approximately one degree of swing. So the total swing of the pendulum when it's in operation uh, is about seven degrees, <clears throat> between seven and eight. <clears throat> and then I had one glass, a gold leaf, and that was done by a lady um, that I got in contact with through the NAWCC. And uh, so she did a real fine job, and I'm really happy. She was upset with me, though, because you notice the three and the nine are vertical. And she says, that's not right. All clocks have those numbers horizontal. And I said, well, this clock is different. <laughs> so she made it for me the way I wanted it. And so I was very appreciative of her. And uh, so that worked out good. <clears throat>